I also tried some interventions to see, can we rescue that loss of muscle um, in some very practical ways? So being protein researchers, our first um, uh, instinct is to use a protein-based um, intervention. And so in the both the older adults and middle-aged adults, we used leucine. Um, and we supplemented the older adults with loose and middle aged and older adults with leucine at each meal. So was so it was leucine on top of leucine a- on top of a, a a fairly high quality protein. We were at 0. 0.9 kilo per gram of body weight per day. So a little bit above the RDA, but not close to that 1.2 that's really becoming mm. more recommended for older adults. So this is still a very moderate amount of protein, but adding in that leucine partially rescued the loss of muscle mass. It cut it almost in half. Thank you to Divi for sponsoring this episode of the show. I'm really excited to share this new sponsor with you because I am using the product myself. I have not talked publicly about my own hair loss journey, but I will tell you that hair loss has been a major issue for me. As I know, it could potentially be a major issue for you. It affects over 80 million Americans, men and women. I have gone through periods of intense hair shedding. Many of my patients come to me because they are frustrated and feeling emotional, both men and women, about hair shedding and thinning, whether it is stress, whether it is age, whether it is extensions, you name it. Divi is a great product, a product that I am using, and it also has a number of key ingredients, including a copper tripeptide, caffeine, tea tree oil, amino acids, which of course I love, and hyaluronic acid. And again, my hair is better, so now I am using it not because I'm experiencing more hair loss, but because I want to maintain the health of my scalp. Do you want to take back control of your hair and scalp health and do it with clean, science-backed ingredients? Well, we have a special offer for my listeners. Go to DiviOfficial.com slash Dr. Lion for 20% off your first order. That's use DIVIOfficial.com slash Dr. Lion for 20% off your first order. Dr. Emily Lance, I'm so excited to have you on the show. This is going to be such a treat for everybody. And by the way, you currently, your official title right now is you are an assistant professor in the Department of Nutrition, Metabolism, and Rehabilitation Science in the School of Health Professionals at the University of Texas Medical Branch. That was a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's why, actually why I read it. I, I just, I, I wanted to make sure uh, I got everything right. Um, not to mention you are a current uh, female researcher with five children. Yes. That is um, uh, quite exceptional. So thank you so much for making time. And one of the reasons why I really wanted to have you on is um, you are really someone I consider a teammate in the uh, sciences and a teammate in this concept and discussion around protein. You uh, worked with former Doug Patton Jones for nine years and had a, a very close relationship with him. I would love for you to speak a little bit about where you did your PhD, what you did it on, okay. and how you ended up in where you are now. Oh, that's a great question. So my... Um, PhD training was at Purdue University, and they had an interdepartmental nutrition program, which was a really great foundation for my PhD training because I got taught classes from people across different departments, psychology, chemistry, all these really, really broad background in nutrition. Um, and I did my project on the concept of fetal programming. So how a mother's nutrition, even exercise can influence the um, outco health outcomes for their offspring, for their kids. And so we use animal models to ask some different questions about exercise, about gestational weight gain during pregnancy, um, and looked at health risks in the, their um off, uh, offspring. And so that's where I did my PhD. And then I graduated and I was like, oh, I need a job. <laughs> One of those I need things. a job. I and I was getting married and I moved to Houston and I ended up um, interviewing with Dr. Patton Jones, with Doug, and we just really hit it off with this great synergy. Um, we, it was like an hour long phone call the first time we talked to each other. We just 
I loved his ideas. I loved the vision he had for his research. And so I, that's how I ended up um, at UTMB or the University of Texas Medical Branch. So It's incredible. And actually what you did your PhD on is really a hot topic now. Yeah, it um, is. And then... And you're not actually looking at, at those components. Not anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore. I still think about it. And I think there's still some future room. I have some collaborators in my department now who are interested in sort of asking those questions. And so I, I'm not completely um, uh, out of the game yet, but I haven't looked at that uh, literature for a while. Well, so. we need you in the vulnerable population and we need you in protein research. And for those individuals who don't know, Doug Patton Jones really made some incredible contributions to the science, and particularly, uh, I'll say, really on, on two ends of the spectrum. Number one, this idea of a catabolic crisis, right. which I would love to talk about. There's many things that I want us to highlight. Catabolic crises and the protein distribution for the prevention of muscle loss, the um, prevention of potentially sarcopenia through aging, which he really, him, uh, Don Lehman and uh, a few other individuals really paved the way sure. for things that we take for granted. And then moving into some of your other research, which you're very interested in, it, sleep and muscle protein synthesis mm -hmm. and menopause. Right. Uh, right. So where do we want to start? You want to start with uh, catabolic crisis? I would love to start with catabolic crises. All right. So the idea of – so I'm very interested in aging research. One of the strengths at UTMB is um, aging research. Uh, and so uh, there's really been a great group of people there for a long time I've gotten to work with on these sort of projects. And so one of the ideas that Doug put forth is the idea where, you know, once we hit the age of 40 or 50, we start to lose muscle mass. And about 1% – a year or 10% per decade. Um, and it, and when you would look at a lot of the theoretical graphs or if, you, if you're measuring someone um, at 40, at 50, it's, just, it's a linear descent, if you will. But that's really not maybe a correct way of thinking about it because what happens during periods of illness or especially inactivity or like hospitalization, you see a very rapid decline in um, muscle mass, even over a period of five to seven days. And so what can happen during a period of illness or injury is when you lose that muscle mass, there's an incomplete recovery. You know, because you maybe you were in a cast for a while or a sling or you just are not feeling well and you're not back in the game exercising, really being active or maybe your appetites decline so you're not getting enough protein. And so you don't recover that muscle mass as much, that strength. And so you have this very rapid decline um, as those illnesses or injuries perhaps become closer together. And so rather than being just this gradual slope, that's actually a lot more steep than we originally mm. may have thought. Yeah, and people think about this idea of a decreased muscle mass and function. Again, you had mentioned that they believe that it's 1% per um, year. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that that is... I think Accurate. initially, yes. I think, you know, when you're in your 50s, probably. I think as we approach 70s, it's a lot more rapid um, in, in the latter years. And so probably up to maybe 3% a year, you yeah. see a, a more rapid decline. But it's, you know, it's hard to measure accurately. One of the most commonly used tools available to researchers is called a DEXA, which measures water content. And so um, lean mass having a higher water content, that's what we typically use to look at whole body lean mass in a... At a popu at, not even at a population level, but just at a at a research level. If you, most institutions you might have an access to an, a DEXA, but CT and MRI are, are um, much more uh, accurate, but they are much more expensive, yeah. and so it's just difficult. It's difficult to measure. Yeah, and I, I want to highlight something you said about the DEXA. It really looks at lean body mass. Well, it actually looks at we're looking at bone and fat right, mass. Right, and, and then, then the subtracting it. <laughs> right. Subtra uh, subtracting it and then assuming lean body mass and then taking that number and looking at skeletal muscle mass. Right. But lean body mass has connective tissue, organs, um, and muscle, but it, it's really everything aside from right. bone and fat. So the question becomes, you know, again, you had mentioned population levels. How are we – actively and accurately looking at skeletal muscle mass to determine this decline by 1%. 
as far as I know, we're, we're not. You know, it's, it's one of those pieces of data that we hang our hat on, but I don't know that we're actually actively measuring. At least I'm not aware of. There may be someone out there who's who has a really great project that they're doing. But um, right now we're just- Hurry the, up, people. <laughs> hurry up. Because we we're the, still we the money. Because <laughs> we're still using uh, DEXA. And I, I just wanted to point that out because while we're talking about these changes in skeletal muscle, you know, from my perspective, I think it's probably much greater. And also we don't look at anything as it relates to actual muscle health, whether there's right. fat infiltration or... Right. Um, and, and muscle mass is important, but muscle strength and function is really at the end of the day, like that's what's keeping you going. Yeah. Um, and, and muscle metabolic health, you know, uh, glucose disposal, muscle protein synthesis, all of those other really critical pieces that are more difficult to measure as hmm. well. So I read in one of your papers, and you are very well published, I don't know how you do that with five kids. Um, I'm still looking for my socks. From 2000 to 2015, more than three out of 10 adults in the U.S. were admitted to acute care hospital, to an acute care hospital. And in 2018, the average length of stay was around 5.6 days. Mm -hmm. And this is what you really kind of say that kicks off this catabolic crisis. Sure. And what Tell me some of the data that you guys have seen as it relates to the amount of muscle mass loss, potentially the amount of strength, the age differences. What can the listener really think about as the you know they go into the hospital or someone they love goes into the mm -hmm. hospital? Mm -hmm. The number one treatment is bed rest. Sure, sure. So when you're in the hospital, you're in bed. You are often not feeling well. Um, you're not off. You might be encouraged to get up and go to the bathroom if that's safe, but there's not anyone in there actively making sure that you're up and, and moving around. Um, and so when I started my postdoc with Doug, I did a series of bed rest studies. Um, and for context, what we do in a bed rest study is we take what we call the best case scenario, a healthy community dwelling adult. Um, we did a couple of studies. So first I'll touch, touch on the older adults and then I'll save um, the middle of the age adults for the next piece because I think that's even more interesting. So we took healthy 60s, 65 year olds, put them in bed for seven days. And what we saw is a change of one kilo of muscle mass from their legs just from that seven-day period. So for context, that's about two, two pounds of muscle just from their legs. So when you go into bed rest, that's typically where you're going to lose muscle mass and strength is in your um, postural muscles in your legs. And so, you know, actually, when we look at a whole body DEXA, because we do use DEXA, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we we see sometimes their legs, or sorry, their torso or their arms. You might act, you're you're pretty neutral as far as muscle mass changes go. Levering yourself around in bed, um, it's really your legs where you see that really critical piece. And what do we use our legs for? Walking balance, all of those really important functional pieces. And so that's often why when someone leaves the hospital, there's this term we call hospital deconditioning. And that's because they've been in bed, they're losing mass, muscle mass, they're losing strength. And so that happens in a really short period of time. You know, we did a seven day bed rest study, but we think it really happens within the first three to five days, and which is a, the typical hospital um, length of stay for an older adult. Then we did a the similar study where we took the same sort of model, seven days of bed rest, and we used middle-aged adults. You know, so phenotypically, we're talking like 45, I think we did 45 to 60-year-olds. So um, I'm approaching, I'm not there yet, <laughs> but I'm approaching that. So phenotypically, they look healthy, they are doing well, you put them in bed, they their muscle loss responds just like an older adult, a kilo of muscle from their Gosh. bodies. In what? So in same, three, same, three to five days. In, in the seven, same seven day time frame, because that's what we measured. We think that it happens more quickly, but just for this particular model, we had used a seven day period that we were measuring pre post. There's some other groups who have looked at a shorter time frame in a, a different sort of disuse model and seen that um, muscle protein synthesis declines, um, muscle protein degradation increases during just a very short period of time of disuse. Wow. Basically, what you're saying is an older adult who is active in community dwelling, mm -hmm. 65 right. or higher, typically when they go into the hospital, they go on bed rest, mm -hmm. which we all know. We've all yep. written orders for bed rest. Um, and those individuals will lose two pounds of muscle. On average. On yeah. average, likely the mm -hmm. first three to five days. Like, yes. And again, this is in, we, we were using a best case scenario. If you are thinking about an older adult who's ill, you're going to have a more pro-inflammatory environment, which means that muscle loss likely occurs either to a greater magnitude or in a shorter period of time. 
That is fascinating. And a 45-year-old individual who is healthy will also lose the same amount, roughly two pounds. Right. And that's in what you're saying is called the best case scenario. Correct. This is someone who's not ill, who, you know, we we do a full we do a full medical workup. So no history of any metabolic illnesses or anything that would maybe contribute to a sort of a pro-inflammatory environment. Just that disuse model itself is enough to do that. Can you imagine if the majority of the American population is overweight or obese and approaching whether diabetes or insulin resistance, would you anticipate that their muscle mass loss would be greater? It's entirely possible. Um, Also, when, when you see that loss of muscle mass, we also see a decline in insulin sensitivity very rapidly. Um, And so... In, in addition to looking at just this model of disuse, we also tried some interventions to see, can we rescue that loss of muscle um, in some very practical ways? So being protein researchers, our first um, uh, instinct is to use a protein-based um, intervention. And so in the both the older adults and middle-aged adults, we used leucine. Um, and we supplemented the older adults with loose and mi- middle-aged and older adults with leucine at each meal. So was so it was... Leucine on top of a... Leucine on top of a a, a fairly high-quality protein. We were at 0.9 kilo per gram of body weight per day, so a little bit above the RDA, but not close to that 1.2 that's really becoming mm. more recommended for older adults. So this is still a very moderate amount of protein, but adding in that leucine partially rescued the loss of muscle mass. It cut it almost in half. Okay, so let's let's dive a little deeper into this. Sure. Do you happen to remember the macronutrient breakdown? How many grams of protein you guys were looking at? Do I remember in grams? I want to say it was mm, – no, don't quote me okay. on this. I won't. I, won't. I don't. I don't. I, I think was it, it was 30 grams of protein it, perhaps? It was not quite 30. Okay. It was not quite 30 because, um, you know, that 30 – it's recommended. One of the reasons it is around 30 is because you're hitting that 2.6 right. to 2.8 grams of leucine that yes. you need. And because we were supplementing with leucine, um, we didn't think it was necessary to really bump up the protein content of the diet. Because one of the other things we did is we held, because they were in bed rest, we had to lower their caloric intake to meet. We used uh, some, one of the standard equations to, cal- uh, to calculate their energy needs to try and keep their body weight neutral. Mm. And you added leucine to the meal. Each meal. Each breakfast. meal. Yep. And, you know, when we think about this from an at-home standpoint, right. if your protein is high enough, you potentially don't need to add leucine. Correct. But you guys were adding leucine to bring up the leucine threshold, which Correct. for the listener, if you're new to this podcast, leucine is an essential amino acid. It is a branch chain, <laughs> which is necessary for muscle protein synthesis. Right. It really initiates that process. It initiates and, that process. And so since there wasn't enough of a protein in their diet itself, we didn't need to add additional protein because we wanted, like I said, balancing the calorie needs versus the protein needs. And so that was um, that was really promising. Um, one thing I will add is in one of the studies, we took the participants an additional week um, beyond that initial seven days. So it was actually 14 days of bed rest. And leucine was pretty effective at minimizing the loss of muscle mass during that first seven days. But then when you got into that second week, there was really no difference between the groups. So we called it the leaky life preserver, if you will. Like it's really good for the first seven days, but then that overwhelming catabolic um, environment of disuse really takes over and leucine can't really keep up anymore. What I'm hearing you say is that there is potentially kind of a a safety factor where the first seven days the body can keep up. And when you say that the the catabolic nature of the body, the catabolic environment, do you think that – or did you guys look at was there an increase in inflammatory markers? What kind of things were happening physiologically? Sure. So we um, did not measure inflammatory markers in our study, but others, um, Micah Drum in Utah, has done some studies looking at inflammation pathways during disuse and sees, especially systemically, you see marker, um, inflammatory markers go up um, systemically. Some locally in the muscle, but primarily it's systemic. And so that sort of pro-inflammatory environment um, increases protein degradation. And so I think that's 
one reason you see that increased loss of muscle with um, extended periods of disuse. Pretty uh, concerning considering 50% of Americans are not exercising. Right. And the, the bed rest is a very extreme model. Um, you know, we have a setup, a UTMB, where we can, we have video cameras in the room. We have research nurses don't you move. who are don't modern. You, you know, they we, get out of that bed. Exactly. I have one of those set up in my kid's room. Don't <laughs> you? And so, but um, Stu Phillips actually did a really fascinating, similar sort of parallel study where they looked at just a reduced activity. They called it the Canadian winter um, sort of model where, you know, it's older adults who don't leave their house because it's cold. And they saw a very similar decrease in muscle mass, not to the same extent, but even just reducing someone who's highly active or moderately active to very low level. I think it was like 1500 steps a day. You saw a very um, steep decline in activity or in muscle mass. What was the, the big takeaway from the catabolic crisis model? And just these studies that you worked the on. The biggest takeaway, I think that um, one one being that you really need to start thinking about your muscle health in your 30s and 40s. Um, you know, thinking about these middle aged adults who were losing muscle, you know, phenotypically, outwardly, they looked healthy. We wouldn't think, you know, especially if you're a physician or someone who's taking care, you know. Or even for yourself, if you go into the hospital, you're not thinking about, hey, I'm going to have this procedure done and I'm going to be fine. You know, I'm young, I'm healthy, I can still recover. You really do need to start thinking about your muscle health earlier than we really thought. Um, and the other piece that I wanted to highlight, one of our interesting findings from these two studies is I, we, we recruited healthy men and women for both studies. Um, and what we found in our middle-aged adults is that women um, actually seem to be somewhat protected against the muscle loss compared to men. So they lost just, just a little bit less. And this is a pretty small study. So it's not statistically significant, but it was an interesting trend in the data. And then when we looked at that same sort of gender breakdown in older adults, the older men and the middle-aged men, they lost the same amount of muscle. V very similar, about, about a kilo. The women, the older women, lost a significant uh, greater amount of muscle mass compared to the men, the age-matched men, as well as those middle-aged women. And so one of our, my hypotheses coming from that is that there's something about that menopause transition, probably the loss of estrogen, <laughs> that um, really puts women at risk um, for disuse-based um, muscle mass loss. Thank you to Element for sponsoring this episode of the show. I love to train, I work out a lot, and I sweat a lot. And this is why it is very important to replace electrolytes. If you are living an active lifestyle and you care about your health and wellness and you're concerned about dehydration and having headaches, muscle cramps, fatigue, potentially not performing your best, this is where Element comes in handy. It is a full electrolyte cocktail. It has 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, 60 milligrams of magnesium. I always use Element when I train and also always use it when I travel. You can head on over to drinklmnt.com slash Dr. Lion and you will get eight single serving packets free with any element order. This is a great way to try all the flavors. Head on over to drinklmnt.com slash Dr. Lion. Again, this is another staple in my wardrobe of supplements. That is so fascinating. I think it's an area of newer research. Yes. Um, yep. As it relates to skeletal muscle mass mm -hmm. and estrogen in particular. Right. Um, what do you think, I know that you may be working on some of this that we're not really going to talk about. Um, do you have any hypothesis as to, um, is it a slow decline? Do you think that there is a time where there is a pretty significant drop off? And probably most importantly, mm -hmm. if we identify those vulnerable populations, what can be done? Is it a dietary protein? Do you think that there is a hormonal intervention? What... What happens? That's a good question. And at this point, it would just be speculation because, like you said, it's a area of new research. Um, but I think that there is something there. I think that, you know, women who probably are still in their 40s and 50s, so pretty early, you know, the average age of menopause in the U.S. is about 50. And so I think for those younger middle-aged women, they're probably – there's still some estrogen floating around. They're probably okay. I think it's really once you hit that 65 plus, you've been – 
estrogen deplete for a longer period of time, you're particularly more vulnerable. And that's what that tracks with um, risk for heart disease, that risk that tracks with the risk for other chronic diseases like diabetes. And so there's also, I think, this increased risk for loss of muscle mass um, that occurs in women compared to men. Um, women tend to be more frail. They're at high risk for sarcopenia. So there's some broader um, uh, other diseases that we already know women are at risk for after that menopause transition. I think this just it makes sense and adds another piece to that puzzle. It'll be fascinating to be able to identify specific individuals sure. that are at greater risk before going in. Yeah. Maybe, you know, the initial orders going into the hospital sure. will, hospital sure. will be higher protein diets. Um, now, you had mentioned something. You said you believe that it begins maybe 40s and 50s is when we really need to start thinking about muscle health, maybe 40s. Yeah. Do you think that even in the 20s, Absolutely. Where do you feel? Where do you feel it really should start? You know, it's a lifelong thing. <laughs> you know, I think it's similar to how we think about bone health. You know, our bone, we, we spend our childhood building our, our peak bone mineral density, and then we start to decline. And I think muscle mass may be not that different. So I think it's some, something to take care of, be mindful of. And I think it's about building habits because dietary protein isn't something that you can just, well, what am I trying to say? Dietary protein is important. You need it at every meal. Um, and if you start eating that way, it's, it's easier to just sustain as you get older. You know, one thing that happens as you get older is your appetite starts to decline. Um, and so if you are thinking of carefully about how do I want to continue to incorporate dietary protein for my muscle health, and it's not something new that you have to learn, because, you know, we get old, we don't want to learn new things. But if it's something you've already baked into how you, your lifestyle, then it's easier to, to maintain as you get older. And is this where the uh, work started with the 30 grams of dietary protein, this distribution concept? So this is sort of in parallel. That was um, a, so Doug did an, a series of studies where um, so how do we land on thirty grams of protein? Some of it has to do with leucine, but um, he really was uh, really liked to push back against this more is more for protein sort of mindset that some people have. And so he did a couple of really interesting early studies where he he took older and younger adults and gave them thirty grams of beef protein. And the good news was that the young women or the young people and the older adults acted, their muscle protein synthesis responded the same way, which indicated that the older adults still had that, were able to mount, you know, that protein synthetic response to a meal. Um, and then he took that same sort of population and gave them 90 grams of protein. Like, you know, more is more. Let's see if we can increase. And you saw no increase above that 30 grams, um, that level of muscle protein synthesis that occurs at, at um, 30 grams of protein. So what that tells us is, is there's sort of a threshold. You know, we, we need enough protein, but if we need more, those amino acids are just being oxidized um, elsewhere for energy. So there, we do need protein, but we probably don't need maybe as much as you think. Uh, although 30 grams is still, you know, you do have to be mindful about how you get that into your diet, especially in your breakfast and lunch meal. And so then the 30, 30, uh, 30 came about that he and Don um, started working on that study together, looking at this sort of distribution. Because if you look at NHANES, so NHANES is a um, population-based data set. It's done every so many years. Um, and they gather a ton of biomedical information. One of that is diet, diet records. And so when they looked at, when you look at just the total amount of protein for the day, are people hitting the RDA? Most Americans, even in the older adults, sometimes older women struggle to hit the RDA for protein. But by and large, we all eat a sufficient amount of protein across the day. To prevent deficiency. To prevent deficiency, yes. Calling you out. I, I know. Yeah. The RDA is for deficiency, yes. Which is 0.8 grams per kilogram or 0.37 grams per pound. Right. Um, and so, but when you look at how it's distributed across meals, the average... The NHANES data at the time indicated that the average breakfast was about 10 grams of protein, lunch maybe 15 to 20, and then dinner was like 60. You know, that's when we're around the steak. That's when we're really loading up. And so it, we call it a skewed distribution because it's really skewed towards the evening meal. Uh, and so uh, Doug's idea was let's flip this on its head. Let's let's test this idea of a skew versus um, – even protein distribution, where you're getting the same amount of protein for the day, but the timing of how you eat your protein is really crucial. And so, and that was one of those, that paper came out, I think in 2014, that really got people talking about, it's not just um, how much protein you eat, it's it's when you eat it. It's, when, it's having that even distribution of protein across the day. Hmm. And one of the things in the data is that 
the idea of this even distribution is this first meal of the day, which you and I were talking about before yes. we started, yes. is this concept that it's most easy to measure. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe nearly all the studies, I haven't seen any studies looking at the middle meal or the last meal, have you? Not when it comes to protein synthesis. There's a second meal effect, I think, and people have looked at for blood glucose and some other outcomes, but not not that I'm aware of when it comes to proteins and muscle protein synthesis. I, I am not either. And that first meal of the day, when you hit kind of that minimum, I will say that I have seen some data that potentially if someone is really looking for hypertrophy, there may be some uh, benefit to going closer to 50 grams sure. At, sure. at a meal. So you hit that first meal of 30 to, let's say, 50 grams of dietary protein. Mm -hmm. There there are initiation factors that happen, IGF-4, um, uh, mTOR, muscle protein synthesis happens. And for the listener, muscle protein synthesis, can we agree that we would define it as this physiological process where there's an incorporation of amino acids? Yes. It is a biomarker yes. for how we assume is a biomarker for muscle health over time. We believe that it leads to a muscle accretion over time. Right. Okay. So that first meal, we have a muscle protein syn synthesis, IGA, um, these um, EIF4, which stimulates, there's this kind of uh, machinery yes. that is happening. Yes. So now I'm going to ask you, the even distribution, do we know that that second meal requires the same amount of protein if after that first meal, those initiation factors are probably upregulated. Do we even know how long? I know for five hours. Do we even know how long that they go uh, for? I don't, I'm not aware. Uh, you know, and the, so if you eat a bre if you eat a breakfast meal at say eight o'clock, you know, eight a.m., it takes about two hours or so for those amino acids to be digested and hit your bloodstream. The peak is peak is about two hours, two to three hours. Um, so the machinery is going to come on. So they, they would probably still be elevated when you're eating your lunch meal and, and maybe hang around. Do you get a sustained response? I don't know. I, yeah. I, I, I don't, Nobody, I don't but know. No one really knows. So yeah. Isn't that yeah. It's so interesting? It um, again, this goes to the, the idea that um, – and I also, by the way, think an even distribution for anyone who is looking for muscle health, mm -hmm. anyone looking for weight loss, yep. for blood sugar regulation, yep. um, through aging mm – -hmm. Uh, Absolutely. There is also no harm in getting a even distribution. No, I, there, you're not going to go wrong. Um, and I think like you were kind of getting that with that second meal, even if you can get just two really good meals a day, because sometimes for people, they're just not that hungry. Um, like I said, especially as they get older. And so really focusing on the first and the last meals. I think you can't go wrong there either. I, I totally agree with that. But And we know that that first meal of the day is really crucial. Mm -hmm. Do you have... Um, a hypothesis as to why. I have my own thoughts, but I, I, I'd love to hear yours. As and then I want to talk about fasting. But I, I want to hear your thoughts on that first you meal. You mean as far as why the first meal is so important? Yeah. I don't know that I've thought about it all okay. that much. So, well, um, I can share. share. Yeah, yeah, please, please share yours. I'm um, interested. The, you're coming out of a catabolic state. Sure. It's a and mini catabolic state. Yeah. yeah. In a mini catabolic state after an overnight fast, you are, if you're eating earlier on, you're in line with this circadian rhythm, mm -hmm. not fasting. Maybe two hours after you wake up, you're hitting a minimum threshold or optimum threshold. You're stimulating the machinery. Yeah. Protecting skeletal muscle. Yeah. It makes sense when you think about it. You, I don't think you want to go that far in between because uh, protein degradation will continue. You really need to be able to stimulate that muscle. Um machinery to, to turn on muscle protein synthesis and rebuild in response to that meal. So. I'm curious, do you think exercise has the same stimulation? I mean, obviously you can stimulate muscle through exercise. Mm -hmm. Do you think that one is more impactful than the other, the uh, amino acid response versus the uh, mechanical load response? Mm. It's hard. I think when it comes down to it, your diet is foundational because if you are exercising, but you don't have that infusion of amino acids from a meal to support the rebuilding of muscle that occurs following exercise, then your exercise is not going to be as beneficial as you want it to be. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm, I'm a nutritionist at heart, so I'm always going to say nutrition. But I think when it comes, you know, for people who may not be able to exercise the way they want to, you know, Focus on diet, pick one, and then build on to the other. But I think if you're going to pick which one to start with, you always want to pick diet. First. I love that answer because 100% of people eat. 
Yes, you have to. Like, and I love eating. That's <laughs> why I like. <laughs> I love nutrition. <laughs> um, so, one hundred percent of people eat, and I, I really do like that answer. There is a, again great benefit. You can't just eat protein without doing resistance exercise, but we do know that if you do that, you have the best opportunity to prevent and maintain the health mm-hmm. of skeletal muscle mass. Mm-hmm. Talk to me a little bit about fasting because fasting has been really a hot topic. It has been. So the idea of – so there's different um, strategies for fasting. There's time-restricted eating where you only eat during a certain window. There's some people who will do intermittent fasting where they'll go um, a, skip a day or uh, to maintain or to lose body weight. You know, um, there's not a lot of literature that's published around how it impacts muscle health. There's um, There was a really great review. I think Dan Moore did it. At, he's out of Canada talking about what do we know about how time-restricted eating is impacting um, muscle health, especially in older adults because, you know, um, often it's middle-aged women who are trying out different di- – middle-aged men who are trying out dietary habits. We know from research that they're probably at risk for um, muscle loss um, more so than maybe their younger counterparts. So um, – I personally think there is something there to look at. There's one study I think Luke Van Loon put out saying there was no difference between time-restricted eating and more of a a spread out. But I think that needs to be repeated in different populations. I believe it was in overweight men. And I really would like to see that done in women because I think women are more vulnerable to muscle loss. And so, um, and you know, when you're time, when you're restricting your eating, you're only eating meals during a certain period of time. So that's the, the pattern I'm most familiar with. So maybe you only eat between eight and two. So one, it's gonna be hard to get all the protein you need in a really short amount of time. And two, um, because your meals are so spaced together, um, are you really turning on muscle protein synthesis? Because the machinery does kind of quiet down. And if you're only stimulating it maybe a couple times instead of that three times with a more spread out meal, you know, it might, it's one of those things. Muscle protein synthesis is hard to measure. Um, and why is that? Be explained to the – Sure. So we use um, – a, te- a technique called a stable isotope method um, methodology. And some of them are uh, some like within the bed rest studies and some of the other studies I've involved in. What it involves is an infusion of a labeled amino acid, um, phenylalanine. And what happens is that amino acid goes into the bloodstream and um, enters the muscle and into the intracellular pool of amino acids that happen in the muscle after a meal. And then as the muscle protein um, synthesis machinery is turned on, that amino acid is then incorporated into the bound muscle proteins. And so we can use special equipment to measure how much protein is available in that intracellular pool, as well as bound up into muscle protein. Um, but that requires a procedure called a muscle biopsy. Which I had to do. So I was just sitting here have thinking. Have you had one? Oh my, no, I have I not. not. I've never had one. I convinced my kidding? husband to do it, but I didn't want to do it. <laughs> yeah. A new study participant, <laughs> a hard pass on that. Um, I was just thinking as you were talking, because I knew you were going to get to the muscle biopsy part, I'm thinking, yeah, so who, what fellows have you guys roped in uh, to be doing those muscle biopsies? Uh, yes, I had to. So we have some special participants who have um, completed our studies because it, it takes a lot. You know, I asking someone to be in bed for seven days. It's a it's a big it's a ask. It's, it's a, a big, big ask. ask, and so I really I'm really grateful for um sure. for to our our participants who have really helped us advance the science because really we couldn't do it without without them. I, we, I've done very intricate studies, and so um, that really ask a lot of our participants. So I'm really grateful for that. This is a plug for any uh, research participants. <laughs> if you live Dr. in the Houston Emily area, Lance uh, would like to put you on a bed rest study. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but it is always difficult. Those individuals, you would do the, obviously the muscle biopsies before yeah. and after, mm-hmm. and you would examine uh, yeah, all before these. the meal. Then about two hours, two to three hours after the meal, look at that incorporation into the muscle. We can also look at plasma amino acids to see how they change as well um, after a meal. You know, looking at different protein sources and how. Uh, plasma and amino acids um, change in response as sort of a surrogate for what would at least be available um, for muscle protein synthesis. You had mentioned this 30 grams three times a day, this even distribution. Mm -hmm. Uh, What we didn't talk about is how are we getting the 30 grams? Mm. Tell me a little bit about how the, again, because a 30 gram protein amount may be different from Uh, quinoa or how how do we think about the 30 gram dose? So um, dietary protein is not all created equal. 
Um, there are different protein sources that have amino acid profiles or makeups that more closely match what our body needs. And so um, there's two factors that we look at when we look at protein quality. One is being the amino acid profile. Does it have the essential amino acids that our body needs? And the other is digestibility. You know, is it even available to be um, digested by our intestine, taken up into the bloodstream, available to the muscle? And so animal proteins are considered higher quality proteins across the board. Um, um, dairy, um, uh, lean, you know, lean pork, all those are, are high quality chicken, high quality, complete protein. So complete being they offer a complete essential amino acid profile. They're easily digested by our bodies. Um, how are plant-based proteins? Um, while some of them like soy can be a uh, higher quality, they just don't match um, what is available from animal protein. Now, I think if you want to eat a more plant forward diet, you can um, probably meet your protein needs, but where you might run into issues are with volume. So if you take a, a serving of lean protein, like, like beef, you need about, what is it? Three ounces. Mm -hmm. So it's about the deck of playing cards. It's palm of your hand, not a, a large amount of meat to really meet all of your protein needs for that meal. That's 30 grams right there. Super easy. But with plant-based proteins, you need a much greater volume. So, um, it's a half a cup of quinoa or beans. That's only about six to eight grams of protein. So to if you're thinking about, oh, I need to get 30 grams of protein, your first step is you're going to have to eat a lot of plant-based like protein to meet it. Yes. I can't, cups, I can't do math. <laughs> Join the club. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, and then on top of that uh, is – if you're only eating a single plant source, often those plant sources are going to be lacking in um, one or two essential amino acids. And so you have to think about combining plant sources to- Like a lysine, like wheat would be correct. low in lysine. Yes. Wheat and uh, beans, yeah. Plants, rice and beans, yes. Low in methionine. Right. Um, how – you had mentioned earlier that as individuals age, they have a decrease in appetite. Mm -hmm. How would someone who is more plant-based be able to – Re, if we're really thinking about sure. the protection of skeletal muscle, especially mm -hmm. through menopause, how would someone do that? And then the other thing that you mentioned was the macronutrient protein. Mm -hmm. What about iron, zinc, bioavailable, uh, You're right. B vitamins? Right, because how, we how talk we a lot about, about protein, this? but you know, it, there are other macronutrients we need. There are other micronutrients we need that you may not um, be able to get if you're really just focusing on plant-based protein. Uh, that's what I really like about animal-based protein or, or incorporating even a small amount into your diet is it gives you room for other um, food sources because I think variety in your diet is more exciting. You're going to meet your um, other dietary requirements much more easily rather than just focus if you're just focusing on plant-based proteins. Um, so as far as how can you do it, that's a great question. Um, I think it's going to have to come down to some creativity and some more planning than you perhaps supplementation if you really struggle to get um, the amount of protein that you need. I think that if you are willing and it's part of your lifestyle to incorporate animal-based protein, that will help you meet your protein needs much more easily. Would you say that if – so there's the 30 grams of dietary protein with an even distribution. Yeah. If you were to go more plant-based, would you mm -hmm. say that's – maybe a 45 gram dose three times a day? Does it depend on the I source? don't know that you necessarily need to go higher. Um, well, like maybe you do to your your leucine needs, but I don't think it's, it's easy. So I'll give you an example. We, are, we were wrapping up a study and we're writing up a paper where we looked at complete um, protein sources versus some incomplete sources and uh, protein sources and then combining um, a couple of incomplete protein sources together. And we did this in looking at muscle protein synthesis. We did this in some older women. And one of the biggest issues we ran into was satiety. So our sure. participants just couldn't finish. We we started out with 30 grams and we actually had to knock it back a little mm. bit because our participants, and we were taking it to an extreme because we were only looking at one plant-based, um, we were looking at wheat-based um, uh, protein for one of the breakfast meals. And it's not very exciting to eat just wheat protein. That was nice. So what is it that? Was, is it that was same, nine. Same it was nine. No, it was that? nine slices. Nine slices of whole wheat bread, <laughs> which that sounds disgusting. And <laughs> and, uh, and no one really enjoyed that meal. <laughs> uh, unless you're wanting to commit carbicide, go right ahead. Sure. The sure. and that's where the majority of Americans, according to NHANES data, that's where the majority of Americans are actually getting um, a lot. Uh, or that's the main source of is that true plant based protein from. Uh, wheat? I don't know. If, I think it is. Yeah. I'm not off to 
because we eat a lot of bread. We love bread. But I I don't love nine slices of bread. <laughs> nine slices. And so they, they couldn't finish that. So yeah. if you were we, to, we to knock it back, yeah. The goal was to make an equivalent if it was just coming mm-hmm. from wheat. And yes. they, they couldn't finish it. They couldn't it. finish it, yeah. Thank you to Inside Tracker for sponsoring this episode of the show. And as always, especially with this conversation of aging, as I had with Dr. Emily, we must think about what is going on within our body, our inflammatory markers, our blood counts, the biomarkers that are critical to our success as we age. You can take this into your own hands and get your own blood work. How you're going to do it, you're wondering? Head on over to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion, and you will get 20% off your order. There's a whole store there with a whole host of opportunities to see what is happening within your body. Don't wait. Do it. Get it done. If you haven't done it yet, you need to. Insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion for 20% off their entire store just for listening to this show. So your overall recommendation would be to incorporate a combination of Mm -hmm plants and animals. And the other interesting thing that you said was that in your bed rest studies, you added leucine. And another way potentially to think about it is if you didn't want to eat three or four ounces of an animal-based product, you could potentially eat half of that and then add in, um, I I typically recommend either a full essential amino acid mix because Mm -hmm. you do need all of the essential amino acids or uh, potentially even a branch chain um, supplement may be beneficial. But then again, you're also missing this food matrix. Right. So right. And those, they're hitting your bloodstream a lot more quickly than they would in a whole meal. Well, okay. So what happens? What are, are your thoughts? The typical meal, a typical mixed meal would take mm-hmm. about two hours. Right. What is the implication of a liquid meal of a, of a shake? Or is there a potential uh, downside to that robust amino acid response? So I'll t- I, I, I don't know if I can give you a really direct answer because we didn't look at muscle protein synthesis, but in that bed rest model, we did another arm. We did a lot of participants uh, where we replaced all of the protein in the diet, but most of the protein in the diet was whey protein. So instead of giving them um, – you know, you know, for breakfast, maybe you had fruit and pancakes and then a whey protein, a whey protein shake. And the other group would get pancakes, sausage, and the same fruit salad. So it was very matched in the content of the diet. It's just instead of getting, you know, an anal based protein, they would get whey protein. And we saw that just improving the quality of the protein in their diet using whey protein par- had an effect on the, the, it slowed the loss of muscle mass in those older adults offering them a uh, high quality because whey is the high one of the pretty much the highest quality protein you can get and so that was able to very very partially protect their loss of muscle and what dose was it just was it it was this we just replaced the protein so it was 0.9 hmm. okay so probably one scoop of yeah something probably 20 grams or so easy easy super, super easy super easy and so if that's a concern for someone who's like hey i'm really struggling to get protein in their diet you know, I, I don't personally use protein supplements right now, but I've thought you about five it. kids or eating off their plate. I yeah, pretty much like, yeah, I'm I really. <laughs> did this fall on the floor? No, it's totally I, fine. I'm a, I'm a super good. taster. I did a, one of those studies. Oh, you are? Yeah, where they like painted your tongue. And so I'm really, I, I can taste a lot of whey very easily mm-hmm. and it kind of has a better taste to me. So I just, I, the taste of it's kind of off putting. But for those of you who like whey protein, it's really a great place to start. So I, I absolutely agree with, with you. Um, Now, you have been involved in translational clinical trials, really, uh, which I think is very fascinating, focus on developing an understanding of the changes in molecular markers in skeletal muscle during the periods uh, and immediately following disuse. The, that really is, is the biomarker for that, um, is that muscle protein synthesis? Are there other biomarkers that you guys were looking at specifically? Just out of curiosity. So there's a study we're looking at right now. So one of the things we noticed during bed rest, so this is building on the bed rest study, is that um, you see, despite this very rigorous protocol, you know, we we had these participants locked down essentially, uh, that you saw, still saw a very a variation in how much muscle mass I lost. You know, on average, it's pretty consistent. It's about two kilos, but you have some some people where the muscle just falls off and then some that are more protected. And so we really want to get at, 
Are there some biomarkers apart from muscle protein synthesis? Are there some genes that are protective against muscle loss that these people are expressing? So not getting necessarily at um, genetic variation where we're looking at alleles and genes per se, but more what's what's differentiating people and how how they're losing muscle. That is fascinating. I did not know that. I haven't really thought about that. Right, because you... there's responders, non-responders. Well, yes. you know, some people don't like that term, but I'm going to say it because it's easy to, to understand. But there's some people who respond really well to exercise. You train them for 12 weeks. They put on muscle like they, they're supposed to. And then you have some who don't. You have this, you know, we follow a bell curve, even in yeah. even with something that should be it's the same stimulus. But there's some people who are more, resi- you know, either high responders or low responders. So there is that to disuse as well. So what's protective? That's incredible. This idea that there is a variation um, of this disuse and Mm -hmm. atrophy and hypertrophy. So both ends of the spectrum. Have you thought about, um, I'm going to lay out two things that just come to mind. Number one, uh, past history of training. Uh, potentially, I'm sure you guys looked at where they were starting with muscle mass and probably body composition similarities. Mm -hmm. Or is it a fiber type? It's a great question. So that's something we're looking at is we're taking muscle biopsies because that's what we do uh, to look at muscle fiber type composition. Um, as far as training history goes, you know, we try to get people who are somewhat recreationally active. We're not look um, who have maybe they trained when they were in their 20s, but, you know, we're, we use a middle age population, so they're not currently super active. So. We're working on changing that. We're working on changing it. Yes, just we wrote are. a book called Forever Strong, and we are definitely working on changing that uh, trajectory of aging and thinking about it. But you did see variations of individuals that were more vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And just do you have any hypothesis, or it's really still early? It's really to still tell? too early to tell. Okay. Um, I, you know, there there's probably some genetic um, play in it, but we just don't we don't know yet. So. I was looking at some of your earlier research too, and there was you were looking at. Those that were also more at risk for hyperglycemia. Yes. And th- that was a genetic component. Yes. So in I mentioned earlier that uh, when you have that extended period of bed rest, you um, – insulin sen- sensitivity drops. And so from the diabetes research, you know, to really identify what genes or what alleles um, are responsible for some of the physiological processes that we're looking at, you need to have these huge genome, genome-wide association studies, which in the, with diabetes, there's that sort of literature in the populations that are available. And so what um, we did is we took those probably top 10 genes that are most associated with hyperglycemia. And we looked at the genetic variants in our population and we were able to identify that, yes, if these participants had these genetic variants, then they were more at risk for um, uncontrolled glucose or not well-controlled glucose during bed rest. And so it's, you know, thinking about how that would be used in the clinic, you know, we're not quite there yet, but if you know your genetic very, you know, genotype when you're going into um, a clinical setting, your healthcare provider could use that sort of information to say, hey, we need to more closely monitor this person's blood glucose. We're not there yet, but I think right. I think that's where it's going. And I mean, overarching, if someone can be ambulating up and walking, oh, absolutely. they have to be. Absolutely. Regardless of gene type, those uh, individuals going to hospital or even you listening at home, mm-hmm. if you are listening to this eating a bag of Cheetos, you're in big freaking <laughs> trouble. Uh, we know. you will be inspired. <laughs> Those individuals going into a hospital setting, mm-hmm. we know that if it doesn't really matter your age, if you are going on bed rest, which again is a pretty extreme mm-hmm. model, but an average person will lose two pounds of yeah. muscle. Yeah. If you are younger, you will be able to recover uh, faster than if you are older. But again, we are now more sedentary than ever before, and 50% of individuals aren't even exercising. This becomes a challenge. And then the next thing is you know, in my mind, as a clinician who sees patients, the immediate thing that I would think is, are there some potential muscle stimulation devices, especially sure. in leg muscles that you could put on like a, a stim suit or or something to create that contraction? I think there are some, I want to say there's a couple of studies. I'm not familiar with mm. the literature very much on stimulation. Um, but I think there are some people who have thought about that. As far as walking goes, you know, that's, it's it's walking a fine line, if you will. <laughs> no pun intended. Uh, no yeah. pun intended. When you're when you are hospitalized, because for some older adults, because of the medications they're on, because of problems with balance, they might be a fall risk, and that can be a, an issue for them. But if you are able to, you know, we um, 
another group in that bed rest study that we did, we had them get up and walk for 20 minutes a day um, at a moderate heart rate. So they were actually meeting, if you can believe this. So the threshold for, um, or the recommended amount of, they were meeting the recommended amount of um, exercise for the week. They met the, the heart. Yeah. Well, a part, it, it, we should say this was in the absence of any sort of other activity you would do in the background, but their heart rate, because we had them walking fast enough, their heart rate was elevated enough for 20 minutes a day to meet that physical activity recommendation. Which is 150 minutes. It was 150 minutes in the absence of any other activity. So I will give you that caveat, but that was still not enough to prevent the muscle loss. They were no different than our controls. There was, they lost a little bit less muscle than those who had no, that, that they didn't have protein support. They didn't have, um, uh, any whey protein on board, but they were very similar to our controls. The one thing that we did see that was in insulin sensitivity was I was going to ask you, what about their insulin sensitivity? Their insulin was probably was, better. Was, was, yep, that was preserved during bed rest. So there was that benefit. So even though they still lost some muscle, and I think their strength was somewhat preserved too, because ma uh, muscle mass and strength don't always follow each other. Sometimes that loss of muscle mass will precede the loss in strength. Mm. So. And the opposite is true. Sometimes you'll get stronger before you see right. uh, mass. You wrote, uh, you've authored quite a few papers again, and I encourage everyone to go look up uh, Emily, Dr. Lance. And this paper, this was improvements in sleep quality and fatigue are associated with improvements in functional recovery following hospitalization of older adults. And this study focused on the relationship between sweet sleep quality and physical functioning in older adults during their hospital stay and at a four-week follow-up. And the goal was to understand how changes in sleep quality and related factors might impact recovery mm -hmm. and functional independence after hospitalization. I would love to hear a little bit more about it. I'm not putting you on the spot. By the way, I have notes here if you would like to me slide them <laughs> over the table. Let me see what I can remember <laughs> if I need you to slide it over. Yeah, yeah I got it. it. Um, so this was a study that um, we started out as kind of a, a collaboration with um, – I have a good friend who's a sleep researcher, uh, but she's interested in bio outcomes. So a lot of times sleep researchers are somewhat self-contained and looking at sleep outcomes, but she's interested in getting into more of the – what are some other health outcomes that sleep can impact, which is great. We, we've gotten- Aside from cognition. Aside from cognition. But, you know, so um, in this particular study, we were, we were looking at um, sleep and physical function in older adults post-hospitalization. Because we know that sleep's disturbed in the hospital. That's a really well-known phenomenon, you know. <laughs> what uh, is the okay. average waking? I don't know. I think it's like 37 times, something outrageous. No way. I, I, I'm exaggerating, but- But it does um, feel like that. We I could. Can, I can say after having- I've been in the hospital when I've had my five kids. And um, one is I'm always lying in bed. I'm like, I got to get up. I'm losing muscle. I'm losing muscle. I got to get up and walk. Um, but the other one is, um, yeah, they come in at night. They disturb your sleep. Um, and I think hospitals are recognizing that and they're trying to make changes. But that's an institutional thing that takes time and, and changing culture. But what we did in this study is we have an acute care for elders facility at UTMB. And so um, – as patients were admitted, they were in, you know, they opted to enroll in the study. We gave them a questionnaire at the beginning of their stay, and then followed them until 30 days after their discharge, and looked. At, the questionnaires were about sleep, and then we also did um, some physical outcome measures. So what we looked at is there's a it's called the SPBB or short performance short physical performance battery. And it's a series of a uh, few tests to look at lower limb extremity um, function. And it's especially important for older adults. Yeah. It's really only valid in older adults. Right. We did that in um, in geriatrics yep. where I did my training. That was one of the things that we always yep. So there's at. a chair yeah. rise. So can they get up and down, balance, and then um, – no, sure. I walk there. Yeah, and then gate speed, gate speed. Mm -hmm. So they're all they're all scored. Pardon me. And what we found is that um, one of the things that was most predictive of physical function post hospitalization was actually daytime sleepiness. So it not so when we think of sleep, we often think of oh, I couldn't sleep at night. Like my, I wake up, I don't feel refreshed. But that also then follows you throughout the day. So if you, it kind of makes sense if you think about it. If you are tired during the day you don't want to get up and do anything. So these people are coming home from the hospital and instead of getting up and even just walking um, or doing something very simple around the house, they're not doing anything. And so what that plays into is that incomplete recovery, um, lower physical function following hospitalization. And so 
they're more likely to be rehospitalized. Um, and so we followed that up then with another study and found a very similar outcome with a larger group of people where um, their physical function is their sleep is very predictive of physical function, uh, even at 30 days um, post hospitalization. Do we have a, a molecular understanding? We're not there yet. Um, there was a, a you know, post uh, older adults post hospitalization. They're not really up for muscle biopsies, so we're not there yet. But what, you know, there was a study that I did a few years ago with a group from Australia where we looked at um, sleep deprivation. So it took a group of uh, young adults deprived them of sleep overnight and looked at muscle protein synthesis pre-post and found that just one night of sleep um, deprivation will, um, de there's a decrease in muscle protein synthesis. So there is, skeletal muscle has a high number of clock genes, which are part of the circadian rhythm. So it's not surprising that it's impacted by sleep, but we're just now starting to understand maybe the implications of sleep health and muscle health. Um, so, so say that again. I just think it's so important for the listener. Sure. Um, yeah. Say that again for them. Okay. So I, which part? The uh, lack of sleep, so sleep deprivation. I'm assuming they went sure. 24 hours with no sleep. Yeah, I think I think that's what it was. So they went. Uh, these young adults went about 24 hours without any sleep, and we saw a decline in muscle protein synthesis. There was another group that followed this up where they did five days of sleep restriction. So not total deprivation. I don't think any of us could go five days with no sleep, but they restricted their sleep to I think maybe four four hours a night, maybe three or four hours, and saw a very similar decline in muscle protein th synthesis. So if you are someone who is chronically sleep restricted or has poor sleep quality, then it's likely that that is having an impact on your muscle health. Immediately makes me think of individuals that are staying up all night trying to work, raise kids, mm -hmm. college students and beyond, uh, entrepreneurs, right, and individuals with sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. Uh, military folks going through hell week. Well, uh, <laughs> there is not much you can do not about that. Not much you can do about that, no. Uh, do we know a percent decline, roughly, or a percent of a blunted muscle protein synthesis response? And can that be overcome with dietary protein? Sure. So if I remember off the top of my head correctly, I think it was an 18% decline in muscle protein th synthesis with one night of sleep Um uh, deprivation. Now, um, there are some groups have then looked at, okay, I think it was in that same paper that did the five, or same group that did the five nights of sleep uh, restrictions. They use exercise to try and overcome it. But I think it was pretty heavy duty, uh, like serious exercises. So that may not, if the reasons that people are often sleep restricted, like you said, kids, schedule, work schedules may often prevent someone from being, from exercising like they did in the study. So I don't know if that's always going to be a practical solution to overcoming sleep restriction or sleep deprivation. And so um, as far as dietary protein goes, I don't know, because then it comes down to timing. Um, when do you, when would you need that bolus mm -hmm. to prevent the decline in muscle protein synthesis? So one thing I'm interested in thinking about in the future is how do we improve sleep in populations where that might be appropriate? So post-hospitalization, post, you know, if someone has a lot of pain, addressing their pain to improve their sleep, improving their muscle health, or at least because I think it's all pieces of the puzzle. You know, often when we do a study, we can only look at one thing, but we're really a whole body and we're, right. we have many systems. And so, and they, they talk to each other. And so it's hard to control that. Um, but we, we can look at, you know, these individual questions one at a time. And it, the idea that if someone is sleep restricted mm -hmm. for a five night, you know, let's say they're getting four hours a night, but there may be some buffering with extremely intense exercise. Mm -hmm. Conceptually, it's interesting. Oh, yeah. That yeah. if you potentially are young and healthy and you're going through a major push phase of your life, if you are not sleeping, potentially could there be some offset, offsetting um, result due to physical behaviors mm -hmm. would be incredibly fascinating. Yeah. Now, I want to talk to you about this protein distribution. Okay. I have looked at some of the literature, and it seems as if we if we were to think about the hierarchy of protein importance, mm -hmm. it really comes down to, in a normal population, a 24-hour response. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that you have a paper, Dietary Protein Distribution Influences this 24-Hour uh, Muscle Protein Synthesis Response in Healthy Adults. I want to talk about that. But before we do, if someone is getting a really robust amount of protein. Let's say they're getting 1.6 grams per kg. So they would be 
double the RDA uh, and in aging, um, you know, between 1.2 to 1.6. So they're, they're going a bit higher, a little bit higher. Would a distribution matter in a young versus old population? So would it matter if they were consuming, well, if you, let's see, if you're eating 1.6, I mean, you're going to be pretty close to hitting your 30 grams just at 1.6 in a single meal. Right. So no, I don't think distribution matters as much once you've hit that sort of that threshold. For I would proteins. totally agree with that. I would totally agree with that. But where it does matter is if potentially you're on the lower protein right. level or right. older or mm-hmm. in some kind of catabolic mm-hmm. crisis. Right. Uh, right. Even maybe if you're training, um, your, your timing of meals around exercise may matter a bit more. But if you're um, if you're just kind of a normal person eating 1.6 to I should say I shouldn't say normal. If you're like me and you don't work out because you, you don't have time be working out. Come on. What is it? I've lift kids all day. So um, close. Very close. Uh, but, you know, I think you can eat your need if you're meeting that sort of tw- modern amount of protein so 25 to 30 grams I'd, distribution may not matter as much hmm. so uh, you know when i think about the the distribution when there's anabolic resistance mm-hmm. potentially for an individual and then you layer in uh cat stanzos uh, look at some of that earlier research where he looked at old skeletal muscle and younger skeletal muscle mm-hmm. and there was a synergistic response of adding in exercise and then dietary protein that older muscle was a robust, uh, mounted a robust response, right. like um, a younger muscle, mm-hmm. uh, which which I thought was really fascinating. Tell me about any of the other, st- I mean, you've got a whole list of studies here to talk about. Is there anything else that is really particularly interesting? Again, this um, dietary protein distribution, how it influences 24-hour muscle protein synthesis, potentially we talked about some of that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, this I thought was interesting. A moderate serving of a lower quality incomplete protein does not stimulate skeletal muscle protein synthesis. So th- I alluded to that study earlier when I was talking about how hard it is to meet protein needs with plant-based proteins. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a st- that was actually an abstract, and we're about ready to publish the paper from that one. Um, but one, I, mean, I want to give it all away. But one thing that we did notice- People will have to read the paper. <laughs> people will have to read the paper, hopefully coming soon this fall to a uh, journal near you. <laughs> but um, one thing that we did notice is that it's easier to moderate blood glucose with uh, animal proteins because the carbohydrate-based wheat protein, you saw a, a robust response to the meal because, so if that's something that you're concerned about, um, that's another piece to be thinking about when you consider should you use plant versus animal-based protein in your meals. Where do you see the future? I mean, we do have this issue of how do we feed a population? Mm -hmm. Uh, Where do you see the future of protein research going as it relates to kind of this, you know, in the science world, I I think people are much less emotional about this plant and animal Mm -hmm. proteins. It it seems as if in kind of the social media world, there is really a lot of um, heated conversations and, and Again, you're a protein researcher. Right. I right. haven't heard any emotion or any <laughs> kind of uh, uh, you know thoughts either way. It purely is what is the the data showing. Sure. And you know the the next question then becomes how do we reconcile feeding an entire nation? And I think that's the that's the question. Um, so I don't know if I have a good pat answer for you because it is something that I mean experts are still wrestle with at a at a global population scale. But I think that we talked about this earlier. It's really about how do we feed a population? Um, you know, there are a lot of plant based proteins that are coming out um, that may be somewhat equivalent in the amino acid in the amino acid profile. But I think it's going to come down to the processing of them. Uh, are they as bioavailable? I don't know. Um, and some of them just, I think it just taste wise. Wait, you're the super taster. I'm the super taster. And just, you know, the palatability. Is this pleasurable to eat? You know, we can, maybe we can produce these, you know, the cost, you know, is it going to be something, the acceptability? So there's a lot of other questions that are kind of beyond my expertise mm-hmm. that really have to be weighed in on um, for how we're going to address those sort of questions. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we're going to continue to refine our understanding of protein needs for specific populations too. Yeah. And uh, one of the other things, I, I don't know if you have heard of the EAA9. 
Have you heard of that? I haven't. So the EA9 is this wise code group, and they're coming out with a protein scoring that's different than PDCAS and DIAS. Okay. And it's really based on the essential amino acids. Okay. And they will probably, so it's based on the nine essentials mm-hmm. because not all amino acids are equally limiting. Sure. And also the impact of these individual amino acids are obviously variable, whether it's uh, leucine, you know, lysine or methionine, um, but basically it's going to be a scoring system. So the idea is how do we move from thinking about protein as a macronutrient to each amino acid as a individual nutrient? Oh, interesting. That's really flipping it on its head. Isn't you know, it? For so long, we've just thought about protein as this singular force, but it's really not. It's not. Uh, it's a little more complicated than that and, and nuanced. Exactly. And then how do we address it at a population, certain populations that are more vulnerable, do those individuals have different essential amino acid needs? Because Mm -hmm. we all know that amino acids have different biological roles, although we speak about it in protein. Sure. Again, these individual amino acids do multiple things uh, within the body versus some of the other macronutrients, Mm -hmm. the way in which they break down. In terms of your um, supplementation, when you think about supplements or dietary supplements, have you thought about that much? Uh, well, we touched on it briefly. Um, are you talking about outside of protein or are you still talking about whey protein? protein? I, you know, thinking yeah. if you were to think about muscle health, mm-hmm. um, have you looked at any, you know, obviously you you look at whey protein. Are there other things that potentially that you've been interested in or looked at or you're really focused on whey protein? We've used whey protein in the past because one is very accessible to yes. um to most people. And I think one thing that Doug and I really valued when we were coming up with some of these ideas we did together was, uh, can this be translated into a population? You Doug know, was really phenomenal about yes. making, for you guys who don't know, Doug Patton Jones, he's published numerous papers and um, there's multiple lectures out there. And he really did a phenomenal job of the translating, the, the translational science into from bench to bedside. Yeah. So really I'm, phenomenal. Yeah. So I'm really trying to carry that legacy on. Um, so that's one reason we chose whey protein is, is it's something that eventually could be used in a clinical setting to, f- to support muscle health because it's relatively cheap compared to some of the other supplements that are out there. Um, but I'm, I think there's still room, you know, soy is another one that's very well researched, you know, for someone who's looking for a plant-based, mm-hmm. um, there's other, you know, the might be some other concerns about that. So again, like what? Um, well, just the estro- you know phytoestrogens yeah. for someone who might be concerned about that. Although I think the literature has kind of agreed it's it's not it's probably okay. Um, Peep, I'll, I'll give you a, a personal story. Um, so my I, one of my kids um, when he was growing up was um, had a dairy allergy for a long time. And then he had a soy allergy, and he started growing you know dropping off his growth mm-hmm. curve. And so we found. So I started doing as a protein researcher. I started looking for what are some other protein sources I can get into. And you landed on cricket? Uh, no, I skipped over cricket, skipped over cockroach. <laughs> um, but there's a, a pea protein-based milk that you can buy now. And that and that's what saved us. That's He got back on his growth curve and he is doing much. He's eight years old now. So I think that's incredible. It's incredible to think that, again, uh, we're thinking about protein and those amino acids mm-hmm. obviously met his needs so that yes. he was able to yep. regain his uh, growth curve. I always think about P again, it's that concentrated. Right, it's sort. a concentrate. Yeah, and, and I, I just don't know how we would get what other. So there's a protein in it, but there's probably other. Um, thank you to First Form for sponsoring this episode of the show. Let's talk about aging. Something that always happens. How we do it is up to us, which is one reason why I love the supplement creatine. Creatine monohydrate has been around for at least 60 years. It is very safe, effective when it comes to muscle health, but also cognition, which becomes fascinating. There is this muscle brain connection. And one of my favorite supplements for this is creatine monohydrate. First Form makes a fantastic product that is very easy to mix. Head on over to firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. That's firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. You will get free shipping on your order with a purchase of $75 or more. That is free shipping on your order with a purchase of $75 or more. I don't know if they're nutrients, but there are other compounds in there that uh, as humans, we don't consume in that kind of quantity. Mm-hmm. 
it's just something that's heavy. Did you I have didn't you think, thought I much about that? No, nah, not necessarily because concentrates tend to be more purified. Pure. And so if it would, but it, there, there is that concern when it comes to supplements, they're not regulated. Um, so I'm always kind of careful about recommending them for people. You know, whey is pretty, pretty, yeah. it's, and it's, it's, been a, it's an for... isolate. It's been around for a long time, but for the new and emerging things, I'm always more cautious. I'm a, I'm a late adapter to a lot of things. Okay. So, uh, where do you think the future is, is just going in a protein research. I know that you currently have a trial underway and you're looking at these sex specific differences in recovery mm -hmm. uh, from skeletal muscle mm -hmm. disuse, which I think I cannot wait for that. Yes. Um, I'm really excited for that one. Yeah. I, I'm i curious as to what the hypothesis is that you're actually trying to test and mm -hmm. is this the future of protein research? I think a lot of the, one of the one of the features of research in general, probably not just protein and in muscle research, but sex-based differences. You know, men and women are not great. We're, we're different. We have different needs. Um, and so a lot of biomedical research was done in men. And so women's health in a lot of areas is still lagging. You know, we, we don't, we're, we're basing a lot of our decisions and our assumptions in, especially muscle protein research is from male dominated studies. And so, and young men, you know, college men, college age guys. And so we're going to start to see, I think a lot more focus on what are some factors that may influence a difference in response between men and women and what, are, what are those factors and how can we optimize muscle health for both um, genders? Do you think that the distribution will change? I don't think, I don't think so. Um, I think d the distribution concept is going to stay. I think perhaps the amount might continue. You know, is it always going to be 30? Do you need exactly 30? That might sort of be tweaked over time. But that's a, is it necessary if, you know, can we use sort of this wide umbrella? Because once you get too specific, it can be hard for people to remember right. like, oh, I'm okay, I'm 35 now. How much do I need? But, you know, but but that sort of, if you are hitting that 30 mark, you are most likely covered. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, any hypothesis as to where you think that some of the changes might be in terms of implementing strategies? Hmm, let me think about that. So I think one thing I've alluded to, but I think across, I think young, in, in younger adults, um, I don't think there's going to need to be as much thought about because most of the time their responses are fairly similar. I think it's really once you hit that aging, as women go through menopause and um, and their risk profile changes, I think that's when we really start to think about what kind of recommendations should we be making for these populations. Maybe you will help change the protein recommendations. Maybe so. <laughs> Currently, it's still, it hasn't changed since 1968. It has not changed, no. No. It hasn't changed since 1968, even though evidence supports that for a more optimal aging trajectory, but it, it really has not defined hormone changes, whether it's menopause or even low levels of testosterone, are there ways to Or protect? a clinical setting, you know, if you're hospitalized, if you're in a acute care setting, do you need more? And and what are the, I think also, we can define need, but I think there's also the delivery. Like how are we getting people who need um, dietary protein to support their muscle health? How are we getting it to them? Mm. Oh, well, if, if I was a, a betting woman, I would say that Dr. Emily Lance may potentially change that uh, trajectory of what is happening. Is there anything that you'd like to add? Anything that you think is really important that potentially we didn't mm. hit upon that is on the top of your mind? I think that we're going to continue to have a better understanding of you know, we, we talked about sleep, but I think there's going to be other things as our body of literature and our knowledge grows. And I think even the idea that you can't do science in a silo anymore. You know, there's not just single – there are some still some single investigators out there, but now a lot of human research is really translational team-based science. And so you're seeing expertise from so many different areas come together to address questions. You know, I have collaborate with a really awesome sleep researcher to do – to ask some questions I couldn't ask on my own. And so I think as you see stronger teams being built, that we're going to see 
wider issues addressed because we have a more complete understanding um, and a, a wider expertise space to start asking some really interesting questions. That'll be incredible. And we will be on the lookout for your papers. And as soon as yes. some of those are coming out, uh, if they are free access, we will link them. So oh, thank you. Visibility to them. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Emily Lance, where can people find you? Well, I, maybe we don't want to say you can't find her anywhere, but you can find her research on uh, Google Scholar. On Google Scholar, um, the UTMB website. I have a faculty profile there. I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me on LinkedIn professionally. So <laughs> Don't message her, guys. Come on. <laughs> don't message her. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming on. It is wonderful to have you in studio and very grateful for your time. Well, thank, thank you, you so again. much. I'm really, I'm really honored to be here, and I really loved having this conversation Me with you too. today. Thank so, you. Thank you. Thank you.